So you'd like to be an artist. Do you have any idea what you're in for in this world? How hard you're gonna work and how much you're gonna love it? The places you're gonna go, the places you're gonna see, the things, you, the people you're gonna meet. It's an exciting life to be an artist. And I wanna share a little bit about that and how you can choose your niche as an artist in what you wanna do. As a professional artist, I really been painting all my life. Uh, not as a professional, but as an art lover. And I never considered it a real vocation or a way to make a living. It just gave extra money to the family. It was a way for a woman, while she had children, to be able to make extra income doing portraits. And that was my first choice in my niche for my market was portraiture. I loved having my kids, so I painted them in different uh, scenes with, uh, with their animals and their pets and doing things. And that ended up becoming uh, uh, something that I didn't even expect because I started getting interest in my paintings as prints to share with other people. And I took portrait commissions and traveled to do those portrait commissions, and many people came to me to do the portrait commissions. But as I continued uh, on and started having prints made of my work, of my children, and my different animals that I loved, because I was always painting something that I loved, I got into a print market where I was actually uh, selling, uh, not personally selling, but a big print publishing company picked up my work and sold my images. And with my images, I got uh, more images because they'd give me as a royalty 100 prints for each image they printed. And after I got 30 prints, I thought, I've got to get rid of these. i got to sell them. And that's what led me to do art festivals. And I've been doing art festivals now for over 30 years. And they were a successful, wonderful way for me to be able to sell my artwork. And my artwork would metamorphose and change during that time where I would start with uh, my portraits of my children and my animals and the farm animals, and I went into a whole series of Amish. That actually led into another uh, opportunity, that which I hadn't really looked for, but it came my way that when I painted all the Amish children, I liked, I liked painting them as, as Amish because I felt like it gave them more of a uh, undated, timeless feel in the paintings. And I'd uh, gone to college up in Columbus, Ohio, and it was Amish country up there. And I had friends in Canada that were close to Amish friends, and the lifestyle fascinated me. So I painted Amish kids, and then I ended up getting a, a, a job to do a book. And the book was called The Simple Pleasure of Amish Life. And that book led to other, and other books too, that just kind of about because of the type of art that I was doing that I loved. So I didn't chase the market, the market found me. And I think I was very blessed in being able to uh, make a living that way. When I first really started a serious career as an artist, I was 40 years old. I had six kids and I was in a position where I really needed to make a living for my family and actually create real income. And my first choice was to do portraits and the next choice was to uh, do teaching. Because again, it came to me, I got a call from a friend and they said, hey, uh, can you teach at this particular club? And I said, well, I guess I could. Can, can you teach uh, watercolor? Can you teach pastel? Can you teach acrylic? And I said, yeah, I can do all, all those. And and I uh, interviewed with the club and they took me on. That was, like I said, 30 years ago. And I uh, have been doing it and still love it, still love the people. I consider them very special. And I teach at, at actually three different clubs I've taught at and still teaching at two of those three clubs today. And really, uh, just treasure the people that I'm working with, treasure watching their progress, the new people that come in, and the enjoyment that these people have from painting and being able to teach them to paint. So teaching has been a great pleasure. COVID brought a new pleasure to me that was totally different. I never looked for or decided I wanted to do, and that was Zoom classes. So there I was suddenly doing Zoom classes, another, another different source of income, a different a discipline that made me stretch myself a little bit, make it make something different happen in my life too. So that stretched me. And um, so now I want to just show you a little bit of my artwork as I walk around. I'm going to turn this camera off and start a number two part of this video so you can see some of my artwork and maybe why I chose some of the subjects I painted. Because I think when you're choosing a uh, category that you want to paint and you're trying to find what your niche is, the first and most important thing is what do you love? What do you, uh, what do you know? Um, what really takes a lot, part, a lot of your mind and heart to do. And for me, that was my uh, Florida landscapes and my, all the different parts of Florida, from the landscape to the ocean, to the birds, and uh, the tropicals, the botanicals, the orchids. So I have really enjoyed the past 15 years focusing more just on Florida. I still get my portrait commissions. I still get other little things that come up from time to time. But my real joy has been um, being able to travel in Florida and see Florida uh, as, as I travel. The other thing that now that I'm uh, 
more uh, closer to retirement age and I got more time, I started traveling and doing plein air. And plein air has been, just greatly enriched my, my life too. The memories I have of painting on site of the wonderful places I've seen has been fa fantastic. So I'll show you some of my plein air paintings. And um, that's, that's how I chose my niche, is for paint what I love. And I found people that loved what I did. And I uh, did, was had to be smart about it. I did have to uh, do a lot of reading to make it possible that I knew how to make my sales and how to, to, to uh, target my market. So when you are looking for your niche, you have to also say, well, do I want to keep all these paintings? Do I want to give them away to charity? Do I want to share them with friends? Or do I need to make a living? And for me, I had to make a living. So my niche became a little bit more uh, focused in a way that I had to choose who my client would be and choose how I was going to sell my work and what would then bring me the most reward for the paintings I did financially and also a good reward for my client that bought it. So I ended up really doing more Florida landscapes than anything else this time. Hi, I'm Eileen Shalom, and I've been a flag member since 2017. Most of my life was spent teaching art on Long Island to public school children. It was a rewarding and fulfilling career that allowed me to inspire and be inspired every day. When I retired from teaching art in 2006, ending a 32-year career, I began my career as a full-time artist. My husband and I bought a home in Delray Beach, and we started to split our time between New York and Florida. I joined several art organizations and networked with amazing artists who have become very good friends. Being in Florida offered other exhibiting possibilities and my work started to be seen. After all, isn't that what drives most of us? My art has taken many twists and turns from realism to semi-abstract and now abstract. To what, that's what I'm doing now. I'm using mixed media on canvas, wood, and paper. I enjoy the process of painting, then placing torn and cut papers or fabrics or string or whatever I can find into the piece, painting around it and over it, and repeat. My art usually takes on a whimsical, childlike, playful style, probably informed by working and playing alongside children for so many years. I've been inspired by my own travels and by literature. Most of the work I have done in the past few years has been influenced by the words in Italo Calvino's book, Invisible Cities. In this book of imaginary landscapes, I found my mind traveling and needed to create my own imaginary cities. What you have behind you here is one of my newest paintings, um, partly based on this Calvino book. But the process that I did here was, I don't always start this way, sometimes I work directly on canvas, but I was on vacation and I started a watercolor. And then from this watercolor, I decided to, to turn it into a little mini painting. And from this mini painting, I photographed it and imported it into my Procreate program, which I'm going to show you right here on my iPad, which is invaluable, I think, for me, and could be for many of you. So the painting, which is this, turned into this after I played around with lines and color and shape. So for one thing, I have this set to white right now, and a pen, and I'm going to just start to draw where I think I might want some circles. And then, if I don't want them there, I just touch erase there and erase there. So there are lots of possibilities with this program. Anyway, back to the painting. Today I would like to show you some of the things I use to, to, uh, to do my collaging into my paintings. Right now this painting I would say is 85% done. And some of it has been collaged into in some mark making and pen and paint marking. 
But um, I just wanted to show you a few little things that I do. One of the things I use is I use stamping and stenciling on deli paper. And with this, I would use a fluid matte medium to attach. I see this face. I've been thinking about putting this here. So it's been cut to size. And first I'm going to put down my, my glue. And then I'm going to place the piece where I'd like it to go. And brush over it. Another technique I use is I take tissue paper okay, and I attach the tissue paper to not eight and a half by 11 uh, printing paper using a glue stick to attach it on one end, put it in my printer upside down and forward and, and um, put something in the printer, scan it and then this is what, what happened afterwards. I have some of the lettering that I had on this paper. Where is that paper? This is from a piece of origami paper. And now I'm going to show you that if you use gloss medium, I'm going to, I'd like to continue this down into the little windows here. So what I would do to make sure that we have the irregular edges, I'm going to dip a brush into water and just go around with the water so that when I rip it, I could just pull it apart cleanly because I don't really want to cut. I don't want very hard edges. Then I take gloss medium and it melts right into the background. First plate, brush the gloss medium on the piece, place the lettering, and then brush over it. And I plan to do that all the way down, and I might just, I probably will paint over it and obscure some of the print because on both of these it's a little, a little harsh. Uh, one more technique is I use tracing paper to, to outline spaces that I want to, like, like patterns that I want to place in doors and windows and other such things. I put the tracing paper on top of the paper I want to cut right here, and I'm going to cut my little black archway. And one quick cut. Take the tracing paper away. This door will get glued right here. Uh, this painting is called All You Need Is Art, and I believe that is all we need. almost all of my life, uh, but when I retired from the corporate world, I decided to make it my full-time occupation. I started out doing acrylics, and after a while I switched to watercolors, and then I discovered pastels, and I realized that I really loved them, and I've been working with them ever since. The pigments in pastels are the same pigments that are used in oils and watercolors and acrylics but they're in a stick form. They're put together in a stick with a binder and so you don't use a brush or any other tools. You just use your hands. This is a pastel board and it's already colored so I don't need to do an underpainting with this but it has a gritty surface too and that gritty sanded surface picks up the pigments that are in the stick and it almost gives it a dimensional quality because of those little flecks of paint that are on the surface. Just let me just give you a demonstration using um, a darker color, like for example this purple. Really takes it very nicely. And a medium tone like this um, gorgeous bright orange. 
and um, a lighter tone like, um, let's see, how about this nice light blue-green. People call it a drawing medium sometimes, which it can be, but it's really a painting medium because you can use the side of the stick to make a stroke just pretty much the same as you would with a brush or you can use the edge of the stick to make lines as well. So you can do either drawing or painting with it or a combination of both in the same I'd like paint. to take just a minute right now and show you what I've been working on lately. Last year when the pandemic started and we were all staying home all the time, I decided to go ahead and try another medium and I decided to try out oil painting. And then I discovered the method of using cold wax with my oil painting. These paintings are done most of the time with a palette knife rather than a brush. I hardly ever use a brush. But uh, let me show you how I do this. I mix the paint with the wax and then apply it with any one of a number of tools. Here I'm taking a brown pink, which is a transparent oil color, and I'm going to mix it with about an equal part of the wax, the cold wax. So this is a tool that I'm going to use called a brayer. This is a specific brayer made for oil paints and, and wax. And I'm going to dip this in here and get it nice and coated. Okay, so now that I have the oil paint and the cold wax mixed together and applied to my brayer, this is a canvas paper. Normally I don't paint on canvas paper. I paint on stretched canvas. So I'm going to roll this paint on using my brayer. I don't always do the... Un this, I consider this an underpainting. And I don't always do it with a brayer, but I like my first layer to be pretty thin. And I may not apply the same color all over the canvas. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm just going to put a little bit of this paint on here. So there, so there's my first layer. Now I have some yellow ochre paint here, and I'm going to mix some wax in with that. Now I'm just going to apply some of this yellow ochre to my canvas paper using the palette knife. You'll notice here that I continue to fill the whole, the canvas paper with the brayer. And some of it has some texture to it. I don't roll it out completely. I let it keep some texture to that. And I would wait for this to dry for a while before I would add anything else to it normally. But with the palette knife, I can get a much thicker application. And then I have a, another tool that I like a whole lot. I'm not sure what this is called, but on one end it has two rubber tips and one end is flat with a point and the other end is a point. So I can, I've created some texture now and I can do some scraping through here with this tool. This is a really handy and fun tool to use. I can make a thinner line using this. And I have another tool that I like to use too. I think it was probably originally a skewer. <laughs> and I can make some thinner lines with that. These kind of tools are really great when you're working abstractly. The other tool that I really enjoy using are my oil sticks. These come in a few different sizes and of course all kinds of colors and they're a lot of fun to use. Again, I would normally do this after waiting for the paint to dry for a while, but depending on what you've got, you can get some interesting effects with these. They're a lot of fun to use. I think I've discovered that using the pastel sticks that I've come to love over the years and my new love, which is oil paint mixed with cold wax, I guess that's my niche and I'm sticking to it. Well, maybe. <laughs>
narrator telling a story through my paintings. I am working in this field more than 45 years. I have experienced lots of changes in my whole life, but nothing could not take away my painting, my art from my life. I always try to express myself through my paintings. I do different series with different subject. This one migration series. 10 painting of that series I finished. This is very close to my heart because this subject talk about my own life in a different country. I love to use different layers of color, lines, the lines come to me automatically. Another series of mine named Captive. I talk about the women in this series. I use lots of pattern and design, even thread work also. Total 10 painting of captive series. This is one of it. I use lots of pattern and design in this series. This pattern I influence from Indian temple and mosque. Three dimensional painting of captive series. I always research something different, make my painting interesting. And I use obviously lots of lines and layers of color with my technique. Title of this painting is Icon, size is eight by six feet. I use all the pattern from the ladies undergarments. I do the painting without frame. That's why I, I need to hang this canvas in my studio wall sometimes. Sometimes I do in, in a big huge table. Sometimes I need to use the ladder to reach the top of the canvas. I like to share you a small story how I started my line drawing painting. I got an offer in the gallery to make a solo show. So when I visited the gallery, I saw the gallery wall is huge. Then I make a plan how I display my all painting. I make a big, big panel with my line drawing and I put my painting on the top of the panel. That way I display my whole show. From that, I started line drawing painting. I still doing the same thing. I fall in love with this line. <laughs> latest painting. This painting size is 8 by 6. I use millions of line. It took three months. You can feel it how crazy I am to use the line.
Hello, my name is Nadine Saitlin and I am a visual artist. Uh, I do paintings and sculptures. And what I want to talk to talk to you about today is how I got involved in my latest project, which is painting gourds. Um, I started out uh, several years ago doing what I called uh, assemblages. I collected materials and I wrapped them with various uh, feathers and raffia and reed and came upon the gourd form and started to wrap the gourds. I think we have a still that you'll get to see a wrap gourd. Those have all been sold and, and I'm delighted they took hold so well. But then I decided that I would use the gourd as a surface to paint on. Um, that it could become my canvas and I could do third dimensional paintings. The gourd is a member of the pumpkin family and has been used over time to do utilitarian wear, cups and, and musical instruments and decoratively. My thought was that it would become a perfect canvas for third dimensional paintings. So what I do is I cut open the top of the gourd empty the seeds out, you can still hear them, in this one, clean it out, and then start to prepare it for painting. I take the inside, this gourd is in process, I take the seeds out, I put a varnish inside, and then I paint the outside in one color. I usually use white acrylic spray paint. Uh, I then sketch my ideas in pencil, on the surface of the board. Uh, the intriguing thing for me as an artist is that it is a third dimensional form and I'm working with two dimensional shapes uh, on that form. And as you can see, it's a continuous design. So even if I'm doing something like this particular piece, which I call portraits, each portrait is interconnected to the next portrait and there is a flow around the surface of the particular form. Um, the gourds come in different sizes and shapes. I've been lucky enough to find really large gourds. Uh, I go to sites such as um, Amish Farm, Welburn Farm, and I've even been known to uh, go on eBay and bid on them. This particular piece for me is a true abstract painting. I call it Images of the Mind. And as you can see, the images dance around the form. They grow from the bottom up and they grow around the form. Uh, very upbeat, uh, playful. I had a wonderful time inventing these, uh, these images. And, and one of the things that I find remarkable about this is that anybody who has one of my pieces becomes part of my creative process. And they choose what they want to see and they can often move it around and display different images. Different themes appear on different uh, gourds. As you can see, this is my mindscape. This one was a collection of celestial bodies uh, with a darker background. So, um, Theme and variation plays a big part in deciding what to do. Uh, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to show these pieces not only in fine art shows, but also that I have been able to locate two websites uh, that have these pieces for me, can sell these pieces for me, and I'm represented at a crafts gallery in St. Petersburg. Um, so, uh, <coughs> Please be part of my process. Enjoy the third dimensional aspects of my work. Thank you. I'm Jane McIntyre. Uh, I want to talk today about drawing during the pandemic 
and I work for models for my artwork, so how do we solve that problem during the pandemic? One of the ways I have for them to solve that was to draw on Zoom. Zoom uh, has given me an opportunity to work with live models uh, in lieu of the studio, and instead of having to work from photographs, the photographs give me a two-dimensional surface to work from, whereas the Zoom can more closely approximate the three-dimensional uh, feeling and the space of a live model session. Uh, the primary uh, source of you know different sessions, a lot of people came up with different solutions. Some of them would be large Zoom sessions with many people um, involved, and they'd be traditional Zoom, you know, modeling sessions. One minute poses, two minutes, three, five, 10, 20 minute poses. Uh, I also had a small group that I would work with where a three hour pose was possible. Uh, the one of the challenges of working on Zoom is the lighting. The model is at home, usually, in their own space. They don't necessarily have studio lighting, so we have to depend on their overhead or their side lighting from a window um, that they possibly have. Um, so we have to work with that. The other challenge is trying to get the whole figure in of the model. If you get the whole figure in on the Zoom session, you don't have a close enough view to do detail work necessarily. Uh, one of the solutions to that was if the model would allow it is to do screenshots where you can take a picture of the model in the pose that you can then work from later on if you needed to as a reference point. Uh, of course, permission from the model is, is necessary for that. Um, most of the sessions were not nude. Some of the more professional sites I've been on would, would allow nude modeling. But, you know, having, the, having access to it, and the nice thing is you're at home and you can access several times a week. I would find several different groups to work with. So I always had a, a wealth of models to work for from in the last two years. Some of the other things I've done on Zoom are classes. I'm sure the people have given classes. I've also taken classes online uh, with people like Stephen Assail, um, the Portrait Society did uh, a Zoom session um, where everybody, they had a live person demonstrating from a live model and invited everybody to draw along with them. Um, and so some of these, these drawings here are from that particular session there. The one at the bottom was developed um, after taking a class with Stephen Assail. What I would do is take these images, some of them are standalone. Some of the quick studies, I like quick studies. I like what you can do with those when you overlap the model. You can see different, uh, you see the movement, you know, in the one minute poses going quickly from one position to the other all on the same page. Um, then some of the five minute to 10 minute drawings, you can capture an expression or a moment in time that sometimes if you're working for 20 minutes or an hour or three hours on a pose, you lose some of that energy and spontaneity. So I like having those images and then I can go and further develop those later on without losing the spontaneity uh, on another piece. Um, some of these um, are completed drawings within the session for th you know three hours. And some I just take and then just develop and try to do different things with, including paintings down the road. Uh, I try to take those images and do something else. These are, these are some examples of some of the paintings I would start working on based on prior sessions with the models. These are watercolors on Aquaboard. I like working with the same model. I, I don't mind working at the same for the same model all the time. So my private group, they would have a, maybe two or three models that we would work from. But I like the challenge of having that same model come back because I can then do reinterpret them each time. Uh, I don't have to worry so much about what they look like. I just need to, you know, take that image and uh, be more creative with what I come up with my art.
Jane Lawton Baldridge. I am a sea level girl. Perfection is having the bow cut through the wavelets like a hot knife through ice cream. Surrounded by diamonds glinting off the wrinkles on the water. Intoxicated by the fragrance of the sea breeze. Looking up at the sail trim that I believe would make Bernoulli and Newton proud. If not scudding across the water by sail, then perhaps floating in the delicious turquoise, buoyant from the salt and the magnesium surroundings, or a standing, toes in, forever hopeful that the treasure will arrive on the next wave. When I was young and foolish, I thought the highest achievement one could have was finding a perfect specimen of a queen conch on one's walkabout along the shore. Now I realize the real treasure are the small fragments of shape and color that many more stories behind their journey. My paintings are my sea stories. I discovered I have a pattern. For five decades, I stop and paint moving water at least every four to five years. They speak visually to the life on board I have spent. Some paintings are about perfect days when there is no prettier color than turquoise and or sapphire blue for the shallow depths and the deep ocean. But life's not always like that. There are storms and days when things go sideways. To paint requires being as brave as to sail through a hurricane or a stormy night far offshore. I want everyone to have a seascape to look at. If not out their own window, then through my eyes on a canvas, on their wall. I want them to want to protect our waterways and oceans as well as the life that springs from it. If you do not go out on the ocean and witness its power and beauty, you won't understand the rushing water born on a storm. Currents, tides, and runoff change the land. This can manifest into the magic of an oxbow forming in a river or a beach house undermined and falling into the ocean. I've had a fascination, maybe an obsession, with water for as long as I can remember. Watching my childhood sandcastles fall to the continued impertinent rolling in of the waves and tide captivated me. It was but a miniature version of what happens all around the globe. Now, much of the coastal areas of the planet have reason to watch their own erosion, subsidence, and the rising tides reshape their world. So my second focus these days is a project called Oceana Phenomena, Sea Level Stories. Oceana Phenomena is about sea level rise and water quality. Using art to reach the public heartstrings in a way that graphs and data do not. We are late to address this problem and we need to approach it from every angle. I acquire used mannequins and then we cover them in recycled navigational charts specific to areas at risk of permanent inundation and then paint them with waves and water climbing up their bodies. Both my abstract seascapes and my mannequins are meant to relate a message about the water. They are beginning to travel together to help warn people of the risks our future holds for most coastal inhabitants and others whose climate is changing. I hope everyone takes time to see their stories. I'm at my studio in West Palm Beach, uh, unincorporated in an area called Country Estates. Trinity, my artist granddaughter, is filming this for us. You will see a collection of my paintings, sculpture, all the different types of paintings that I have done, Impressionism, 
techniques of the masters, photography, abstracts, florals, portraits, paper mache, and others. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy viewing what I've done and maybe you can decide what my niche is. I think maybe portraits or human image might be the main thing that I enjoy doing, but I enjoy just creating art and being true to myself. Two of the pieces that I might mention are The Politician, which is my oldest piece that I have framed still, and it is it was painted in 1973, and it hung in the DuPage County Courthouse uh, for quite a while, and was written up in the little trip. The uh, abstract Twin Towers uh, was the Best of Show Award winner in the 204 Florida Artist Group exhibition, and I have it in my collection here. But I enjoy just creating art and being true to myself and knowing that uh, I am creating something original that hasn't been done by anybody else anywhere. And that's the whole purpose of art and the meaning of art to me. My art has been very acceptable this far in my career. I hope that you enjoy seeing my art and I thank Trinity for filming it for me. And, and I hope to continue to be creative. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much. professional photographer by trade, my most recent endeavors find me under the surface doing underwater fine art. So you might say, what is underwater fine art? Well, I'm here to explain. It's actually a type of mixed media that first of all starts with an underwater photo session with a beautiful model, beautiful clothing where color and design have had a lot of thought in it. Uh, I really don't see an end image when I'm shooting. I just kind of follow, follow the energy flow of the images that I uh, capture underwater and go from there. But after I have all the images, I edit them, which is a very extensive type of process, as you well know. And when I see the right image, I just know intuitively. And I also just then follow the energy and use my imagination to either create a storyline behind it or sometimes just enhance with beautiful artistic embellishments. Some of them um, I've actually done alcohol inks and acrylics on. So you can see how adding a little bit of a story behind it and creating this scene brings these images to life. So there is an extensive amount of equipment that you need and know how to it's not like photographing above water the lighting is different so i control my lighting with a big tarp that i put over the pool area because i want the light to be soft and very conducive of beautiful womanly skin then i also pick uh, whatever i'm going to do with clothing and i'm usually picking color more than anything and when i see that image i start to create so it's the most fun I've ever had, and I'm not going to stop. So I thought it might be interesting if you could see how an actual shoot goes. Uh, there was a woman who was a model, but she really was a normal person. She wasn't like a real model. But just to show you that it can anybody can really do it, and it's really a ton of fun. Most women who have done it say, wow, that was an amazing experience. So I call that type of commission, Unleash Your Inner Goddess. So I'm always looking for mermaids and mermen to avail themselves of the opportunity. You'll not ever have an experience quite like it. 
So let me show you how a session actually goes. Bear with me just one moment. Okay, enjoy.